Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Bill Francis. I'm a, in business development with NG Distributed Solar out of Chicago. NG's uh, North America headquarters is actually in, in Houston, in case anybody's familiar. Uh, a little bit of background on NG. They're a really enormous uh, global energy company headquartered out of Paris. They're actually, I, I think, the, still the largest independent power producer in the world. Um, now, let's break this actually down to North America. So in North America, um, NG is actually the number one distributed energy storage company. We have over 100 projects deployed, um, various scales, everything from just tens of kilowatts behind the meter in California, all the way to multiple megawatts in front of the meter with or without uh, uh, renewable systems. Um, we have the largest solar and storage facility currently in Massachusetts. I suspect that that will change in the next few years as the smart deployments uh, begin to roll out. And then we also have actually the first behind the meter storage uh, project in, in Massachusetts for P-shaving and, and ISO participation. Um, I'll get into some more details later if you guys have questions about NG. I wanted to spend less time on this because I think you're probably more interested in the rest of the content. Um, so let's talk about distributed standalone storage. I've kind of broken this down into a couple of different aspects, um, just a few slides. Can you guys read that? It's a little small, I apologize. <laughs> um, well, I guess I'll do my best to talk to it. So what can a distributed standalone uh, battery do? Well, uh, that can do a number of things, some of which Matt already covered. Um, you can do kind of basic things like uh, distribution and transmission asset deferral. You can also participate in, in wholesale markets if they exist. You've also got, you know, things like microgrids. But, but some of the most common applications, especially in the sort of distributed uh, you know, arena, which is in, I think, a lot of those audience members' cases, your systems, which are generally uh, public power, relatively small compared to large um, IOU territories, you've got possibly some uh, demand charges that you pay, whether they're related to coincident peak demand on a, you know, wholesale supplier, whether they're related to capacity charges within a market. SPP has a little bit of a different structure than like PJM and MISO, which have a bit more straightforward um, rules for offsetting capacity costs. But, but batteries, distributed batteries can be just as good a capacity resource as large, you know, tens of megawatt batteries in, you know, in, on the transmission system. In fact, sometimes they can even have advantages. So, uh, I would say in this case, like you have a lot of different options for deploying batteries at distributed scale. And when I say distributed, it could be 500 kilowatts. And, and um, we're talking primarily about front of the meter projects here. We can talk a bit about behind the meter um, if you have questions. But front of the meter projects, that even at 500 kW or a megawatt, you know, that would be kind of the, the smaller end of a distribution connected distributed project on the battery side. Um, you could go all the way up to you know, 10 megawatts, but that just depends on your distribution system and the feeder's ability to support that kind of project. So just as an example, a use case from our you know, broad base of projects, um, we're almost finished with construction on a project in Colorado for United Power, which is an electric co-op serving an area just outside of Denver. And they decided they wanted to deploy a system to uh, do like a community battery concept, just like community solar. Who in here is familiar with community solar? Okay, so most of you. So a customer, utility member, or, or you know, third third party buys into a you know solar project, just a share of it for some kilowatt hour reduction off of their retail bill. United's going to roll out the same concept for this for their customers, and they're going to let their customers buy into this distributed scale battery. It's about four megawatts, four hour battery directly connected to their distribution system and allow their members to offset kilowatt charges, capacity charges that they wouldn't necessarily otherwise be able to offset. And they certainly wouldn't get that benefit if they were participating just in community solar. So that's one example of a program that exists for like a distributed standalone battery project. Distributed solar plus storage. What can you do when you couple solar and storage on the distributed scale? Well, you can also, you, you, among the things that, that Matt mentioned related to dealing with intermittency, so dealing with like duck curves or dealing with ramp rate issues, you can increase the capacity value of that project. So again, in certain markets, not necessarily SPP yet, I will say SPP is coming, um, you can actually physically increase the capacity value of that resource. So for example, in PJM, just as an example, you get credit for the capacity of your solar system based on what it generates in a particular set of hours. And if you use the battery, you can actually amplify what it's generating in those hours. So for example, 
on your system, if you tend to take a similar view, you're going to ascribe some amount of capacity value to a distributed solar project. You can add a battery and, and monetize additional capacity from it. Now again, ITC, great thing to take. You know, if you, can, if you can make the use case work, it's really, really fantastic to be able to take the investment tax credit on a battery coupled with solar. Um, the, the baseline rules there, which I think Matt didn't cover in too deep because I think he was leaving that to me, um, you got to charge at least 75% from solar during that first five-year recapture period. And whatever amount you charge during that period uh, in the, like, the lowest year, so let's say you charge, you know, I don't know, 78% is your lowest year, that's the amount of ITC credit you get. So effectively, you need to just establish what percent you're going to charge from solar at the very beginning of your contract because you'll only get credit for the ITC for as much as the minimum year. Practically, we see something between 85 and 100% on lots of projects, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, I guess one last comment here would be uh, our case study again. This is our project in Massachusetts for a um, for utility out there. They we deployed an AC coupled battery system on the back of an existing NG owned solar system. So we actually retrofitted that solar system and took ITC on that new battery system that's providing additional services for that distribution utility. So what about pricing and financing? <laughs> um, this is, gets complicated. Matt touched on it when he talked about, hey, look, you know, no one, you know, those those prices look provocatively low for solar plus storage in that um, in that recent solicitation in in I think it was New Mexico, but uh, but you know, that no one said anything about how big the battery was or or what the power rating. So basically, you're just amortizing the cost of the battery over lots of uh, kilowatt hours, which can be great if your battery cost is really low. It wouldn't add a whole lot to the to the cost of the system. Alternatively, if you're trying to do a battery system that's got maybe the same rating, the same power rating as your solar system, a one megawatt battery and a one megawatt solar system, you'll see an enormous adder to your cost of your PPA. So the, the nature of the size, the relative size of the battery system or the storage system with the renewable generator that you're trying to amortize that cost over, that's what's going to have the biggest impact on that price that you set. Now, in certain cases, developers are, are able to monetize additional market revenues outside of a contract with a utility. Um, in those cases, you might be able to have them buy down the cost a bit. That's kind of what happened in Massachusetts for our project that I just mentioned. But it's not exclusively possible in every market, and that really depends on the wholesale market, in your case, mostly SPP, um, what kind of participation models that market has for storage. And in our case, we're still kind of waiting on a really great participation model for SPP. So uh, generally speaking, you can, you can kind of contract for, for storage, whether it's with or without renewables, um, in, in a couple different ways. One would be a utility-owned system, so we could you know, build it and transfer it, turn the keys over to utility. The other would be a third-party-owned system, in which case you could either um, do a sort of storage services agreement, almost like a lease or something for a, for a battery if it's standalone, or you could sort of um, amortize the cost over the, over the PPA and take it like a PPA plus. Um, there are all kinds of different considerations here charging, um, the control of the dispatch. It's important to mention that if we're going to take the ITC as a third party and own that system, we actually need to be the ones flipping the switch and turning the battery on and off. So what we would do is establish a communication protocol and receive call signals and instructions from a utility who we're serving. That's just due to the nature of the way the ITC has framed, or the IRS has framed the ITC rules. Basically, uh, we have to be in control providing a service with that battery. It can't just be a battery built solely for the utility to operate without our control. That, that would be construed in a way that would not allow us to take the ITC. Get into more details if you want to find me after. <laughs> um, term of the agreement's important. You don't have to run that battery uh, agreement all the way to the same 25-year term as your solar PPA, for example, you can take it in a different term if that meets your needs. We're seeing a lot of battery deals somewhere in the 10 to 15 year range. 20 years starts to be pushing the life expectancy of the battery system pretty far. And anything shorter than 10, you're not really getting your bang for your buck. And last but not least, um, there are little things like credit. Um, utilities, especially these kind of uh, public power utilities, tend to have quite good credit, so it can actually help you in terms of procurement. And also the uh, design and integration configuration of the system, um, something you should talk to, to your developer about or pay close attention to if you're developing your own system. I think that's it for me. Thanks, everyone.